Hello, fellow toolboxers. Welcome to episode number 344 of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox podcast. We love doing these, and I got more than 10. I'm not going to go do 10 of them, but things uh, I've learned in the last week or two, which is important enough, I got to share with you to help your practices. A lot of them are really eye opening, just very helpful. So it's, uh, I know you're going to love this one. So I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, before we start, uh, I always have to say this, none of this is intended for individual legal guidance. Uh, consult with an immigration attorney. This podcast is meant for practitioners in the field. Um, some some homework, not homework, what is it? Just notes that's coming up. We have a bunch of CLEs. We have the one about uh, 212D waivers. That's almost an hour. Top from one of the best people who do these in the game, Daniel Parisi, who's really active in the Rome District. So check it out. If you're not a member of our circle.so community page, just email me with your bar info so I know you're an immigration lawyer, or not immigration, just a lawyer in general. If you want to get into immigration law, it's, it's helpful. And we have the, uh, more than 12 hours, if not much more uh, hours of training in there, including one we did about people who have been outside for 10, 12 years and potentially abandoned their green card. Obviously, it's D3-1, 245-I. What is that? How does that work? What is a three or 10-year bar? Um, business stuff, marketing stuff. It's just a library, just growing every month full of content. It's part of the Immigration Learners Toolbox free material. That's for people that are in the game and want to get better at what they do. So just hit me up if not a member already. If you are, just go to your account on circle.so, access it on the CLE page. It works there. I do want to thank our wonderful sponsors uh, sponsoring this podcast and the upcoming magazine of the Immigration Learners Toolbox. If y'all want to get articles in the magazine, you know, this is an additional avenue for you to promote yourselves and your practices, career development. Ayla is great, but a lot of the panels are the same people all over again. <laughs> Let's be real. I'm interviewing all of them. I see it. And, and they bring new people. God bless them. And they do all these chapters, everyone's panels. But this is another place where you can promote yourself. If you can't get in the other one, uh, you just got to do good material. That's going to help the field. Uh, hit me up. But uh, this one's going to be sponsored by Emigration by Serenade, a great company. A lot of you are working with. I was talking to my friend uh, Cesar, who uh, just absolutely loves Emigration. Like, he's obsessed with it. So, um, you know, people who have it, love it. Uh, it's something to look into. They do free trials and everything. Um, just got to reach out to them, serenade with the C.com, serenade and talk with them. The team is great there. Let them know that uh, you got sent by John Kasrabi or just the Immigration Arts Toolbox. It helps uh, let them know that you know, uh, the, the attention is getting out there. It's always good to try out different things, learn about it, learn competitors. It's an important thing to do. So check it out, serenade.com, serenade with the C. Having said that, let's get the game started. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about today is a really obnoxious issue I've been having for months now. We had a couple of I-130 marriage cases and child of U.S. citizen cases approved out of the Texas Service Center or Texas right when that hurricane happened in the Houston area. And it seems like somehow the hurricane deleted a bunch of online scanned files. I don't know how that's possible, but what's happened is NBC's not getting the documents. After 90 days, NBC says we contacted USCIS. We, we haven't got anything, so contact USCIS. You might need to resend the file or something like that. So we call USCIS. They say, okay, give us 30 days to respond, um, and uh, nothing responding. I'm still in the 30-day period. Uh, but that kind of stuff happens. So it's really important that when you have an I-130 or I-140, whatever is approved, I've added this to my pipeline of like, um, you know, check to see, because sometimes we're like, oh, it's approved. You're just waiting for the welcome notice from the National Visa Center. And if you're not keeping track of it, you won't notice it never came. And the clients might not pay attention either. So have a separate like stage in this, like, okay, did we get the welcome notice to the NBC? Because another issue that pops up that's really annoying with the NBC is they've stopped for the most part, more than half my cases now, adding me to the online account. So I don't get emails. Clients do. And the clients assume I got the email and they sit on it. And so and then uh, like uh, three weeks later, I get in the mail a DOS uh, letter saying, hey, uh, you know, your case welcome notice. And so it adds unnecessary delays to the process. NBC is not being helpful. Even when I email them or uh, go through the NBC portal to add myself as attorney of record, they say, okay, we added you. And I go, I'm not there. Now, what I've been doing is I've been adding myself as a third party representative. So I have to get something. Uh, but uh, this is the headaches of NBC, USCIS. So be mindful, track that stuff. And hopefully you don't have one of these situations where the case gets lost. I don't know how in the world a scanned case gets lost. We thought scanning would solve all that, but problems exist, problems continue. So number two, and this is really, really important. I just learned about this. I should have known about a year and a half ago to help a lot of people. Unfortunately, I didn't. I was talking with, uh, we do free consultations for military uh, people, active duty military service members. And this gentleman told me, yeah, I talked with the firms uh, and they told me about the IMMVI program. It's a special program for service members, even veterans, to get parole essentially for spouses and children. Uh, and it's pretty magical, it seems. I haven't done one yet and I've been posting on Facebook groups and news, uh, new member division, ALA, and all this kind of stuff. No one has responded saying they've done it. 
uh, but they must have, some people must have done it. So look it up. It's I-M-M-V-I, some sort of a, I wish I wrote it, Immigrant Veterans Something Benefit. Um, it, it'll come up under the parole stuff for USCIS.gov. Um, but it's kind of like there's an urgent, require, urgent humanitarian requirement for the person to come. But in a memo on it, they said that uh, urgent could be just, you know, uh, family reunification. So I'm really excited to use this because it seems great because right now, but we'll have one case, uh, it's a spouse of a U.S. citizen in the Philippines. That's going to take forever. If we get a paroled in and just to adjust my status, that's going to be like magic. So uh, we're really excited about that option coming up. Uh, so I want to share that with you. Be aware, I M M M is in Mary, V-I, V as in Victor, I, a special military program for veterans and active duty. Uh, it could be a game changer. Use it uh, before it ends. Uh, I'm not really sure how well it's working, how long it takes. I, don't, I haven't found. If you're all listening to this, you've done the program, please do let me know so you share this because this is, it seems like a magical program. It's, I, I mean, even if uh, Trump becomes president, they probably wouldn't get rid of this one because it's military related. So it's something that potentially stays with us. It could be, again, a game changer for these families. Number three, it's just very important as a practice matter. I saw someone posted on this and they didn't catch it. Unfortunately, a case they got, got denied because of it is that, you know, USCIS accepts, uh, you know, scan signatures, but it has to be ink scan signature. So if a client uh, does a digital scan and the USCIS says, sees it, they're going to deny the case eventually. Even if they take the case at first, they don't notice it uh, when they initially get it. So, you know, once, whenever a client scans and sends us stuff, there's certain issues that we always check for. One is, um, does it look like a digital signature or not? We even ask them, uh, but I mean, you can usually tell when it's digital, it's just too clean. And, and then the second thing we look at is, did the page number at the bottom and the top, those like, you know, expiration date, page number, form type, they get cut off because we'll get rejections or denials for that kind of reason. I've, I've got denials, I got rejections um, because I didn't notice the signature page had that part cut off. So it's really important to pay attention to this kind of stuff. I just wanted to reiterate the, the signature requirement, very obnoxious, uh, but it is, it is what it is. You don't want to get hit by that. Number four, another sad tale um, that we have uh, in, for an expedite request. So we have a case. Um, and this is popping up more and more because the delays in F two A uh, spouse of a you know U.S. citizen a spouse of a green card holder case and minor child of a green card holder, where a green card holder files for their spouse and child case is pending forever. Eventually, they naturalize the minor child drops off. Now, what uh, we should be able to do is just to direct filing for the child with the embassy, so that I one thirty for the child we catch up with the parents. You know, usually the moms and uh, they go to embassy together. Well, we were dealing with one embassy and they're just like diddly around for three months and they give us nonsense answers. So we just gave up and, and just filed through USCIS and said, we'll do a expat request just to have to catch up because I've done that before. Well, we did an expat request to USCIS. Phone operator said, yeah, we'll look into it. And then we got a denial of the expedite. Now the mom's going to have an interview today and the kid's I-130 is just pending for a month. Now we are we submitted a couple of days ago a request to a senator to look into this because it's kind of crazy because now the mom's going to get a visa and she's got six months to come. But how's she going to bring her minor child to the U.S.? I mean, because she can't. So it, it, it's in this no man's land right now. She can't come and she can't wait out the visa. She has to leave the kid home, come here, come back. It's just a, a necessary burden to put on people for ridiculous kind of reasons. Now, they have all sorts of programs, and I hope I'm not missing it, where if the child is born at a certain time or since that, you can still get him in. Uh, for example, there's one case where a guy became a citizen and the child was born after the visa was issued. But before the mother came to U.S., there's some sort of category for that. There's all sorts of weird categories for this, and I hope I'm not getting it wrong. But uh, essentially, for this F2A, you have a child, you know, a kid it falls out. So it's, uh, uh, so, and you become a citizen. So uh, hopefully it's direct for this USCIS expert happens. But just be aware of this kind of nonsense, because another case I'm dealing with Nigeria with the huge, huge, huge backlogs, and actually this goes into the next uh, number, bullet number five, is the huge delays in Nigeria. So we have F2A case in Nigeria, um, and, uh, we did a congressional, like what's going on. They say we're doing uh, F2A documentary qualified cases from 2021. So like three year backlog to do a, you know, a current, uh, DQ case in Nigeria spouse of a green card holder. So that's just crazy. I mean, these people's lives are falling apart. So, uh, we're going to, you know, do naturalization because the person that's like, you know, let's just do it. Be naturalized. Maybe they'll speed it up, but then they have to do an I-130 for the child and then do the issue I talked about earlier, which is. Uh, you try to do direct filing. If that doesn't work with USCIS, then do an expedite. If the case to catch up with the parent, it just it's, it's just a bunch of fees. It's thousands and thousands of dollars. Just put aside the, the attorney fees. There's uh, you know I-130 fee, the headache of uh, of you know making an expedite request, then the IV fees. Um, that's going to be probably over a thousand dollars right there, government fees. Let alone if you want to add an attorney on there. So it's it's really nice. Plus they've already paid an IV processing fee for the F2A case when I was with with NBC. So. Um, is the delays are ridiculous and it adds a bunch of timelines. Now, 
there is a chart, and I'm not sure if I'm allowed to share or not, but if you go on these Facebook groups, they'll share it of console processing dates, what people are seeing, DQ versus not DQ, uh, versus record, it, it, and interview, depending on the country you're from. So that's something interesting to look into if you access it. Uh, but that's that. Now, I do want to pause right here. We have a course called the Ultimate Marriage Green Card Course. We're getting so many re leads and uh, people will interested in this and signing up. It's the best course out there. Learn the you know the fundamentals of immigration law, essentially family-based immigration. What is two twelve based on reading the statute? What is I I forty five two forty five consular processing? How is it done? I would say probably seventy percent of immigration lawyers have not done a consular processing case. I was I thought it was going to be five percent of immigration lawyers have done consular processing because from the beginning when I started I always do it. But I would say probably like, you know, 80% uh, maybe even dumped. It's amazing. So learn how to do it. adjustment status, affidavit support, go and read the 8 CFR, go in line by line talking about how that all works, how to prep for a consultation, who to negotiate with in consultation. Hint, it's always the wife. Um, they make the financial decision. So all these kind of tips of how we make a great law firm and making money and have enough time to do podcasts and all this kind of stuff. I'm teaching it all. Wonderful course. Contact me at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com. Info at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com. Again, that's info at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com. Get the course for your firm. One person signs up, but you know everyone cheats and everyone watches the video. And just do have me do the training. Don't bother. Hire someone, paralegal lawyer. Watch the videos and do the training. Now, course is only sold to lawyers. And then we have office hours for the person that paid too, for the lawyer. Um, to a month, we get together, have an hour, just ask me questions. And I share what's going on. So it, buy mentorships. It's hard finding mentors. You ask questions in these groups. They can't really give you answers. They give you I'm just you have an hour, just pick my brain. And I, I, as you see in this podcast, I'm not a person that hides information. So get it, get it while it's hot. Okay. Number six, J1 visa waiver approval. So yeah, uh, we just got an approval for a J1. I want to share some timelines. This was a person in Europe actually who had funding from a nonprofit. Uh, because of that, they got stuck with the J1. You wouldn't assume it for this country, but we're luckily the country is really cool with constant processing. So we filed the initial case with uh, with uh, Department of State to request the paperwork, uh, I forgot the phone number is, and then contact the embassy. They're really quick, turn around, and then they sent it to the embassy. One thing that had happened was the client beforehand had requested from Department of State on their own uh, a letter, uh, what it, I forgot the term is, um, confirmation of something, uh, there's a special term for it, but confirmation that they are subject to your home residence requirement. Um, and uh, they also said yes, and that case had a case number. And then once we create a new case, new case number came. So they had two case numbers. Eventually, Department of State sent me a letter said, oh, we have to use the same letter, same case number. So I may have caused some confusion and some delay in the processing. But essentially, once the embassy got it from the from the embassy of the home country, like four months later, they uh, four or five months later, they give us a notice that now we're good. To, they approved it. They sent an email. And then about like a month later, USCIS approved it as well. So it's kind of general timeline. It took five or six months to get it done. Um, and maybe it would have been faster if that, that case number issue didn't happen. I'm not sure how much of an effect it was, but we contacted the embassy again with the new number and said, Hey, could you resend it? Northern European countries, super efficient. You can imagine which country I'm talking about or one or two countries and it got done good. So now we could do adjustment of status based on a marriage case. Wonderful situation. Number seven, we got an RFP for medical, but we already sent in the medical adjustment of status. I-693 sealed envelope was in the initial package. We still got an RFP. We're going to send a copy of the RFE. The, the, the client got a, uh, not RFE, of the medical client went to the doctor, asked for a, a reprinting of it. Doctor charge is really obnoxious. And we're going to say, listen, we see, we sent there. We're not going to retest this too. I haven't paid your 700, 800 bucks to get all over again. Cause you messed up. Here's a copy. It's in the file. We have a scan that we sent this envelope there. Check it out. Uh, and see what happens. It's just unfair for people to have to deal with this stuff. We're getting a bunch of RFEs right now at this point. In my uh, in my tracking system, we're tracking uh, what our fees you get. We didn't do it before because we didn't get as many R fees, but like we're getting so many I six for R fees for cases where the person makes like one hundred fifty thousand dollars W two has pay stubs, everything's clean for five years of doing that. There's like no reason for there to be an R fee. We're getting I six for R fees, so we're keeping track of this just to kind of get a better idea because it takes so much time. You know, you get three of these RFEs and the medical RFE, which is about to write this up. Also, that's like, you know, four hours extra time that we don't have that just pops up and we could charge the clients, but it's kind of unfair. Plus in, in the package, when we sell a court, of uh, uh, course, uh, a fixed pay package, we say, okay, you get like 60 minutes, 90 minutes of post filing attorney time. Uh, so that like they'll feel more comfortable and say, okay, listen, if something happens afterwards, there's some time that we're not going to get charged. And this goes into that time. So it eats it up. But at the same time, it's just that like, eats up a lot of your time. They don't expect. Number eight, uh, this is from a great interview I did. By the way, I did two interviews really good with uh, people that are going to be part of the ALA Northern Border Conference. Um, they're like the last two up for the 333 and uh, 343 and 340. 
two, if I'm doing my math right, um, and check them out. Like they're chock full of really good content, especially about CBP stuff. So I really want you to all listen. I go back the interviews. Uh, I was just like taking notes myself for my cases. I've learned so much. So I want you to listen to that. But Mexico has a four year TN visa now. Um, there's a there's better capacity fees for it. Uh, but it's good to know. I, just, I thought it was three. I, I, I do TNs, but I mostly almost always do Canadian TNs. So good to learn about this Mexican TN issue. Now, getting an interview for a Mexican TN is going to take months uh, in the norm, like four or five months probably, unless you keep you know logging in and try to schedule it. Uh, but uh, just be aware, you get Mexican for your TN visa. That's good. They come back in and out and have to avoid having to do an embassy interview again. Number nine, E2. So we're getting word. I've had this happen to me, but more and more people are posting that they're getting E2 visa denials based on 214B immigrant intent, which is really obnoxious, um, especially because they invest all this money. You're going to run a company here. Obviously, they don't have immigrant intent per se, but uh, you know they have their business here. Gonna, so it doesn't make sense to say immigrant intent when the person is going to spend five years running a business here. So uh, it's really weird that's happening. Some they're paying clients for, so at least the heads up that there's a 0.5% or 0.05% or something like that chance that the embassy does some ridiculous thing like doing a 214B denial. Now, sometimes these denials, 214B, are because they have other reasons and it's easier to say 214B and not document it. Uh, but uh, that's something that's very annoying. And finally, number 10, I'm not sure if I talked about this before, but this country of chargeability for diversity visa cases, uh, we have a case where a person or a consult um, where a person's parents were visiting another country when they were born like 40 years ago and had the baby where they visited and they returned to the home country. So their place of birth was that country. And that creates diversity visa issue problems because um, I forgot what the law is, but essentially you have to show that the parents were like there temporarily and not for business or work or, or more permanent or vice versa. And that messes up the country of chargeability for diversity visa. In this case, they're probably going to get denied for it uh, because like uh, they listed their home country as opposed to the country of birth. And they should have listed the country of birth, at least according to what the embassy says. And they want documentation to show the parents were only there temporarily. This is like 40, 50 years ago. They don't have documentation of this. So uh, how are you going to prove that there was a temporary visit? They don't have the old passports or travel history, all that kind of stuff. This is pre-email internet kind of stuff. So they're, they lucked out to win the lottery, but they ended up losing the lottery at the end of the day, not getting the visa. Or, I mean, they have 10 more days unless they figure it out. So uh, it's a very sad situation, very frustrating for those people. But uh, but yeah, this chargeability stuff, it gets, you know, nothing's easy. Nothing's easy. And DV lotteries, a lot of times you see these kind of mistakes happen. Um, they forgot to name a child in there or spouse or something like that. Um, but this country chargeability, something to study, uh, it's it's more complicated than you think. And it pops up in other cases too. Uh, for EB cases, for example, if you got a you know backlog Indian case, they marry a spouse in another country. You got to know the country chargeability situation. Speaking of which, I got a case where um, there was a guy doing adjustment of status, Indian guy, and uh, he couldn't do adjustment because his case was a current, but he married like a Swedish person. So he had filed for adjustment of status, and then he contacted me just to prep him for the interview. And uh, I didn't even catch this. Honestly, I didn't know it. It's kind of embarrassing. But I'm like, okay, just go here. I mean, it's no malpractice because he was going to interview anyways. I went to the interview, and they said, oh, for when you're doing country chargeability adjustment of status, a spouse has to be with you and adjust at the same time. So they denied the case. And so we have to do in like an I-24, I think. I can't remember exactly. Get the case to the embassy. Get the wife like approved to come in or uh, or a tourist visa to come in to adjust with him. I, I Honestly, it was like four or five years. I can't remember. But that kind of was, a, it's in the policy manual too, USA's policy manual. At least at the time was when I read it. Um, if you're going to use country of um, chargeability of a spouse, they got to do it with you at the same time or some situation like, oh yeah. So it was on H-1B. So the spouse got an H-4 and then came here on the H-4. They adjusted status together because now they were going to do it together that was permitted. So it was a nuance of country chargeability. Again, like, like I didn't expect that at the time. I didn't expect this DV-1. I was out of nowhere. Um, but it's one of those nuanced kind of immigration stuff you got to study and be aware of because it could be an issue. So that's it. If y'all are interested in learning about marriage immigration, the course, and we go through all this kind of stuff, we're in the statute. As you see, it's always learning. You got to listen to these updates, come to our office hours, we share this kind of stuff. We do CLEs, everything you can. It also helps to promote you. So if you're one of our students and you know one area of immigration law, well, let's put you in a magazine, let's put you in a podcast. So people know about you, you get business, you get you know, notoriety in the field. That's what it's all about. So, um, you know, sharing your information, making everyone's better, just like you're getting better. I'm immigration lawyer John Kastravi. Email me if you want to talk and connect or circle that SO community page. You want to get the course, info at immigration lawyers with S toolbox.com, info at immigration lawyers toolbox.com. Until next one, be safe. God bless. Bye bye.